So basically, I would really like to thank uh, Professor Ranganathan and Professor Sodamini to make my life very, very easy because there are certain concepts on protein structure as well as machine learning that I'll be covering in the presentation today. And since you have heard the fundamental principles from them, I'll not repeat that, but may like to extend the applications of those methods to understanding and addressing antimicrobial resistance. Now, assuming that antimicrobial resistance is not something that everybody understands, so I have given a very, very brief introduction to the topic. So antibiotic resistance is nothing. If you see, look at a group of bacterial organisms, as seen on the left side of the screen, you would see that there is one organism which is marked as antibiotic resistant, which means that when you give a specific antibiotic, all the other bacterial population will die, but a few will survive because they have acquired or inherent resistance to this particular antibiotic. And since the rest, the susceptible ones have died, the chances of this antibiotic resistant bacteria to proliferate further goes higher. Now, as we can clearly understand why this could be a problem, because in antibiotics, which are functional now, no longer remain functional and the infections cannot be treated. Going further, this is a very static picture. So what Harvard uh, uh, team did a couple of years ago, they wanted to also show this in action. Like, can you see drug resistance in action? So what they did, they made a huge petri plate. The petri plate is of the size of four feet by two feet. So you can imagine a huge petri dish. They actually added media, which are required as a food for bacterial population to grow. And then in this case, they have used E. coli. Then they add an ink to the uh, media so that you know the media appears to be black. And then they divided this particular plate into several sections. So if you look at both the ends, it says zero. It means that this particular vertical does not have any antibiotic. This one has one times the antibiotic. This one has 10 times the antibiotic, 100 times and 1000 times. So as you go from both the ends to the center, the concentration from zero antibiotic to 1000 times more antibiotic, they kept on increasing it. And then what they did, they actually had the bacteria growing in the zero antibiotic thing because it's a, a natural uh, uh, way to grow any organism in a petridge. What they noticed that despite the fact that this organism was not really resistant to antibiotic initially, at 1x, 10x, 100x and 1000x, the, the bacteria actually could evolve and they could reach concentration or survive in concentrations of up to a thousand times more antibiotic. And what you see here in white in the right hand picture is the growth of E. coli. And they have then show, then have shown that there are very many mutations that happen, which actually allow these bacteria to become resistant to the antibiotic, even higher increasing concentration. So this is something which is, uh, which actually we know that microbial, uh, population can develop resistance to antibiotics because they are evolving continuously. So it's not a problem of drugs as such. It's an evolutionary process that is happening all the time and we want to understand this so that we can address it better. It is not just in lab, even in clinic. And since the, the day we discovered our first antibiotic penicillin, you could see that as soon as the antibiotics, as you see at the top of the panel, are introduced in clinic, you start seeing resistance either the same year or a few years later of the introduction of the antibiotic in clinic, which means that it's an arms race. So basically we are trying to discover new drugs, but the bacterial systems always come up with a mechanism to overcome them. Now this is no more a problem that is published in the scientific literature. You will see this in popular media, news articles. And given that we are living in an era of pandemic, these uh, antimicrobial resistance is a sleeping pandemic. And this is something that realization has to come sooner than later, that these are pandemics in the making and we should address them immediately before it gets too late. So in order to address that, WHO actually came up with the priority pathogens list. So some of you who are looking forward to uh, building a career in science, there is a huge plethora of organisms against which the only solution is to develop new antibiotics. There is no other public health intervention that can actually help to address uh, the issues. So this is an entire list for you to follow. What I'm gonna uh, follow today is two examples of how we have done this in case of MTB. 
Now, this is World Health Assembly in May 2015. They identified that antimicrobial resistance is a major issue and they have now a global action plan which is being executed by all the members of uh, the World Health Team. And my lab particularly focuses on education and awareness as well as research for new therapeutics and diagnostics. And uh, for education and awareness, uh, my lab also develops video games so that we can engage younger kids to uh, know more about the complex phenomenon of antimicrobial resistance. So as you can see, there can be several ways in addressing EMR, but the focus of today's talk is to see how do we do early stage drug discovery to identify new molecules that can act on these difficult to treat organisms. Again, drug discovery is not something very common to everyone. So let's get two terminologies clear. One is a drug target and the other one is a drug. A drug target is nothing but a molecule in an organism, which is usually a protein and it is intrinsically associated with the disease process, which means if there is a chemical entity, which in this case, a drug is designed that can work by interacting them to this protein, then you can have the desired therapeutic effect. That means you can treat the infection, okay? Now, in case of TB, the problem is not that you don't have drugs. You have more than 30 drugs that are being used in clinic. But TB very soon from susceptible converts into something which is called as a multiple drug resistant TB or an extremely drug resistant TB, which means that more than one antibiotic are already given for susceptible TB. Approximately seven antibiotics are given for uh, uh, MDR TB. And despite that, half of the patients never get treated, which means that we need to identify new mechanisms by which we can understand and exploit the understanding of the target or the chemical space to work on it. And my lab has been engaged in approaches for identification of novel chemotypes for quite some time now. And we take two independent approaches. One is to basically how do we explore new target space because you need to have new mechanisms as well as exploring new chemical space. So what I thought today, and if time allows, I'll try to quickly cover it. There are various application. So because the conference is on uh, data science and biology, I thought i will try and cover multiple methods that our lab applies and also several labs in the world apply. So in case of the antibiosome space, we use machine learning on small peptides. In case of uh, this particular activity, we developed a very new method that I'll be describing in another one minute on uh, based on uh, identification of small molecules based on understanding of the protein structure. And the last one are graph theoretical approaches to come up with uh, drug repurposing candidates. And I'm pretty sure that we can cover all three. So how, again, as I told you that our lab has been working on identifying new drug targets for DB and we didn't go by any um, opinion based strategy. We took a data driven strategy. We went through all the published literature in DB that was published and applied several graph theoretical methods, methods like between centrality or metabolic network analysis methods like FBA to came up with a list of targets. And these targets were eliminated from whatever, whatever is present in the host, both at sequence and structural level to identify targets only unique to mycobacterium tuberculosis. So now you assume, I'm not going into the details of any of this because this is all published work. So point is now you know which protein as we discussed earlier, a drug target is a protein that when actually interact with a chemical entity, which is a drug, should render MTB ineffective. So basically it should kill mycobacteria, which means that this protein is essential for the function of MG. So we actually wanted to develop new lead generation strategy, which means how do you design new molecules? So we took an example for this as a tab B, the logic was pretty simple. As I told you, it is not present in the host. In MTB, it is responsible for generating metabolites that feed into multiple different pathways. So the point is by blocking, by choking this particular protein, uh, you can actually have several pathways choked at the same time. And more importantly, it has nine crystal structures solved both with the substrate, with the inhibitor, with the cofactor. So you basically, the understanding of the protein structure as well as the binding pockets is pretty uh, good. And we didn't want to basically have protein structure predicted and then make more predictions on that. We thought we'll start with a very robust experimental data sets and build our model on top of it. So the basic hypothesis is that instead of looking at protein from a single binding site perspective, 
we wanted to exploit all the potential binding sites in a protein to come up with combined pharmacophore features that we can link together by various linkers. And these pharmacophore features can allow us to explore different libraries to pick up compounds that now fit in these binding pockets. So the logic is you look at the binding pockets, look at what binds, what are the interaction features, generate a pattern of these interaction features and look for these patterns in bigger library. That is a simplistic explanation. So as on A, you see, this is what I've already told you. So the product of DAB B actually feeds into multiple pathways, ultimately feeding into the development of the microbacterial cell wall, which is pretty, uh, pretty uh, significant for it to survive. So that is our target of interest. And on the B figure, you can see that we have generated six different models. It's very simple. If you see here, I'm sorry about that. If you see here, um, it, this particular enzyme has a cofactor binding site and it actually binds NADPH and NADH both. So what we did, we, we took two models in which this is the basically the, the PDBID. We took NADPH and PDC in the bound form. Then we took only NADPH. Likewise, in 1P9L, we took NADH and PDC and only NAD, NADH. And in these two hybrid models, what we did, we took the nicotinamide part of NADH and clubbed it with the uh, PDC moiety. So because as you can see, PDC, which is, a, which is the only known inhibitor for DAB-B, is very small structure and the interaction features are not specific. We wanted to bring in specificity. But since and the cofactor is used in like several reactions in uh, human as well as microbacterial cell, we didn't want to make it a very toxic molecule. So we eliminated the part which was uh, mostly interacting with the, with the cofactor binding sites, picked up an equitamide part and picked up this uh, PDC attached to it to see if we don't, at the, at the time of design of this strategy, we had no clue that any such molecule even exists in uh, literature or has ever been synthesized. So this was a gamble. We wanted to check if we can find something. And this basically is to provide you understanding of where NAD, uh, the, the nicotinamide binding part is and where PDC is. So if you can uh, see mtb B is a homotetramer. And what I have shown you here is one monomer. It has a C-terminal and the N-terminal domain. And PDC and the cofactor binds here. Zooming into the cavity, which is C1, you see that PDC is at the C-terminal side of C1 and the nicotinamide part is at the N-terminal side of C1. And what we did, we took PDC, we took this part and had an isopropyl linker join the two as our interaction, potential interaction features. So we took uh, six, we generated six model systems. And then uh, don't worry about all this, this is generally done in Schrodinger, but we can also, uh, we already are trying to basically do it with open source applications. So you basically do pharmacophore model generation. So we actually uh, let this MP simulation run for 200 nanoseconds and pick up trajectories, which are represented of the, uh, of the interaction features that are being generated. And it led to uh, conventional, as in the, in the cofactor binding uh, pharmacophore features, as well as the hybrid um, molecule, the hypothetical molecule interaction features. And then we took uh, zinc, acinex, and several other libraries put together. And we did map, uh, we, did, we did a pharmacophore screening, a e pharmacophore screening on entire libraries. Now this, this gave us two, type, two types of data set. One, which was edge set which is coming from your hybrid molecule. Now, this is interesting because we had no clue that this, such a molecule ever existed, but you do find it. And then, of course, the end set molecules are there. Once we have, we know that these molecules exist, like particularly the H set, we generated another library, which is the M set and N set for mycobacteria. So we did a curation of all the potential antimicrobial inhibitors in literature, and it is like 3,400 molecules. And we actually did a structural comparison of the H set versus the M set. Now I'll tell you why we did that in a minute. So this is basically to discuss the initial observations. So what we see for the best top um, H set thousand molecules and top N set thousand molecules, you see that the docking score as well as the ligand efficiency is better for the H set. So our uh, hypothetical molecule has a better binding to uh, the uh, binding pockets of that B as opposed to the uh, cofactor. And structurally, the H set versus the N set are very different. Likewise, the hybrid set versus the mycobacterial set are very different, which means that we have managed to identify new molecules. And as you can see here, the H type 
and the end type, the interaction features don't match one-to-one, uh, -one, which means that we have been able to discover new interaction features. And now we can use this to design molecules that, have, uh, that are more drug-like in nature, okay? Now, why we did that? We did this because the success rate of target inhibition in any drug discovery project in antimicrobials is practically zero. You never start from a target and reach to a drug. It is always uh, uh, that hits that you get from a wholesale screening, brute force, that has given you all your antibacterial so far. So this strategy, what we did, different, was we knew this target was important. We knew this library is shown to kill microbacteria in experimental settings. We generated hypothetical pharmacophore features from the protein structure and then we mapped it to this library and what we have now are compounds that are already shown to kill microbacteria but now we also know that they might be doing it via dab b because target of targets of this particular library are not known in mtb so it's a two-pronged strategy now we know the target and of course that these compounds can be tested now we are doing those tests to find out if they really inhibit that b you have something which is ready at a very advanced level for a drug discovery project so this is our first uh, contribution it's a new method and it, the, this paper is available in bioarchive and it is under review in a journal and jinmay um, is my collaborator on this project and as opposed to several lacunae in the conventional practices our new strategy actually allows us to uh, understand the mechanism of action we can bring in target specificity it has no self-penetration issue, which is a huge problem in case of uh, target-based design. And then, of course, we have chemotype diversity. So we have expanded the chemical space for, that, for MDB that we can look for, and the method is generic. It can be applied to any pathogen. Now, having said that, this is one part of our lab work, but we also believe and are very well aware of the fact that any new drug discovery project has a huge attrition rate, as has been shown here in the figure. So you start with like a million molecules and you won't end up even with one drug and that too can take several years. So in parallel to this, like investing energy in new drug discovery, our lab also invests time in trying to see if we can develop new methods for drug repurposing strategies. So for uh, the seniors here, they'll know what this is. I'm basically explaining what drug repurposing is for people who are new to this terminology. So a simple example, and this is not by data science, this is by serendipity. So silinafil was a drug that was being developed by Pfizer for uh, heart disease, hypertension, and angina pectoris. But when they did their trials, they realized that the drug has absolutely no effect on any of the heart conditions. But subsequently, they, re they realized that it is basically uh, uh, has, has, is, was inducing as a side effect penile elections. Now, a side effect then became the main effect of the drug and Pfizer decided to launch this drug as Viagra, which all of us are very well aware of. It's a very classical example of drug repurposing where something was not thought to be working in another indication, but now it is being used. So point is that you make a drug and you know it is acting via a specific target for disease one, but subsequently you also realize that it can have another target that can treat disease two. So the, the point is there can be similarities between the action of the drugs or there can be similarities in the function of the target that can actually allow you to drug, basically repurpose and reuse this drug in addition to the indication what, in which it was originally discovered for. And there are several uh, reasons why we believe that happens and you can uh, read more about it. Uh, what I want to say is that drug repurposing, there are many, many methods. There are genome-based, network-based, machine learning-based, deep learning-based, and we actually reviewed all these methods very extensively in our uh, review last year. Today's focus is to tell you a network-based method for uh, understanding graph, uh, like using graph theory for drug repurposing. So what we did here, now, this is a simple data. You go to drug bank, okay? When you go to drug bank and you acquire all drug target interactions. So when I say that, what do I mean? You take a drug, see via which target it is interacting, okay? And you draw an edge between them. Now you know this drug works via target one. This drug also works via target two or target one can be acted upon by drug one, drug two, drug three, right? Now what this graph shows us that both in case of uh, individual drugs acting on targets and individual targets being acting up, acted by, by multiple drugs, there is a huge level of promiscuity, which means one-to-one -one interactions where one 
target is being acted upon by one drug and vice versa, it's only 7%. Red, rest, everything, rest 93%. It's not one-to-one -one interactions. So there are multiple interactions and we thought that we can harness this promiscuity to predict drug potential new drug target interactions. So if you actually start looking at drug target interactions in drug bank, there are almost 15,000 and there are there, they are a result of 6,000 uh, 6, odd drugs and 4,000 odd targets. And of this, there are 49 mycobacterial proteins in this list already. So what we did, we simply did one thing. So you have heard of gene ontology. So we mapped each target to their gene ontology hierarchy. And wherever the leaf nodes are actually similar, we generated another edge between the drug target interaction pairs, going from 15,000 DTIs to almost 1,74,000 DTIs. So basically we enriched the network just by not looking at the name of the target, but we looked at the function of the target. So the geo that we used is molecular function. Assuming that if the function is same and the drug is binding at the functional, functional part of the protein, which we didn't do any structural analysis, this is a hypothesis that we, uh, you know, this is an assumption that we made and we actually made the network more dense. And once we made this uh, network more dense, we added the two networks and then removed duplicate. So we actually had a final DPI network of 26,000 odd nodes. Now I will not really have time to explain how did we apply network based inference method. The only thing that we need to understand here is that there are ways in which information gets passed on and is received back by each node in a network. And this is what NBI is suffices on, like it actually is built on that logic. And once we actually applied NBI, as you can see here, all the red dots here are new interactions that we identified from NBI. So one is geo added new networks and second NBI added for the new networks, which with a very high score. Now, when we did all this exercise, we came up uh, with a certain set of targets, which are like 377 new targets, DTIs and 233 new drugs. What we wanted to ensure that any of these target, which is either not essential for mycobacteria or has a role in drug resistance or is present in human should not be taken forward. So we applied those three as filters and came up with a list of these 10 targets, which I'll show you the list in uh, the next slide. So as told you, we applied a combined evidence approach, essentiality, role in drug resistance, because that is what what is required. You don't want a target that is contributing to the resistance profile of an organism. And homology with protein led us to 10 targets. And if you look at the drugs predicted against these targets, they actually are with reported indications of being antiviral, antifungal, bipolar disorders. Some of them are nutraceuticals or obesity drugs, which practically means now we can actually repurpose these drugs to be tested for these individual targets for applications in tuberculosis. And I'll not again describe in details, but when we started mapping these, uh, path, these uh, individual targets to different pathways, some of them belong to pathways that are uh, linked, like say, for example, from polysmate to folate or menekinin. So you actually can have identified combination of inhibitors also from the study that we have done. One uh, thing, if you remember, never in the analysis, we looked at the structure of the protein or the chemical compound, right? So what we wanted to also do some kind of validation to say what we have uh, received or what we have in the end of the exercise, is it even meaningful? So that is when what we did, we looked at the predicted, um, this is, so basically this is the known DTI and this is the predicted drug. And when we did a structure-based similarity at a very high tanimoto coefficient, we could see that for some targets, the uh, known drug actually has structural similarity to predicted drugs. Now, this is interesting because this information was never fed in the algorithm. But for certain other uh, uh, targets like DART or INHA, there is absolutely no structural similarity. But at least in five cases, we found it. So this gave, you know, this actually gave us confidence that the method, method is working fine. And despite the fact that it is not structurally similar, the new predictions are not structurally similar, they are offering us new molecules to work with. Now, given that the first two sections of my talk uh, focused only on uh, small molecules, 
it is for the benefit of the students out there. Small molecules are not the only way to address antimicrobial resistance. There are several other things, and these are not proposed. Most of them are actually in clinic right now, and some of them are will be clinic in very soon. So there are bacteriophages, methods of plasmid curing, CRISPR, probiotics, antibodies, immunomodulation, and peptides. All of this can be used for antimicrobial drug discovery. And what we did in our lab was to use peptides. And I'll show you where. I've been talking only about of only about MTB so far, but if you talk of antibacterial resistance, it is not just TB. It is Enterococcus, Staphylococcus, Acinobacter bovini, Klebsiella, Shigella, and all of these have been nasty pathogens. The problem is not just in infections. If these pathogens cannot be treated, anything from diabetes to chemotherapy to surgical procedures to transplantation will fall flat because all of these procedures require antibiotic prescription. And these pathogens are making it harder to treat even a routine surgical procedure done properly. So it's not just infections, it's the entire healthcare system which is, uh, which is at stake. And the primary cause are not the planktonic or the free living organisms, but the biofilms. And if you look at literature, most uh, of these organisms, uh, they account for 99% of microbial life. So biofilm structure, biofilm is nothing but uh, as we stay in colonies and we think it is safe, microbes also like to stay in colonies because it provides an added advantage of being safe because then they can share their armor to fight antibiotics. So, and uh, just a take home message from this slide is that a biofilm can be up to thousand times more resistant to conventional antibiotics. So you know why do they stay there? They stay in a, a structure, which uh, I'll show you how it looks like. But there are certain properties of a biofilm. First, recalcitrance, which means what? The minute the biofilm breaks open, the residence of the biofilm again becomes susceptible to uh, the antibiotics. Of, uh, when they are in biofilm, these antibiotics don't work, but when they are out of the biofilm, the same antibiotics work. Second, the mechanisms are not the same. And third, they apply several different strategies, which I'll not go into the details, but where it matters is because uh, almost 70% of nosocomial infection, 99% of urinary tract infections, 80% of ventilator associated pneumonias, 87% of bloodstream infections, all of this is caused by biofilms. So there, if you talk to clinicians, they'll tell you how big this is a mess and how do we address it. So this is basically to show you how a biofilm forms. So free living, uh, basically planktonic versions actually come at to a surface, start producing something which is called as an EPS. And when the EPS forms, the biofilm forms in this fashion where there can be mostly more than one organism in the biofilm. The outer structure versus the inner structure is different. Uh, the inner uh, side of the biofilm is more inactive organism. The outer side is more active and there are water channels. So basically, even in biofilm, it's like an entire ecosystem in itself. So if you see here, the metabolically active cells are susceptible to fluorocurulins, whereas the slow going cells are susceptible to lipopeptides. So the way of susceptibility of these cells as you go from central to the outwards is not the same. And just to go forward, what do we have to destroy them? So our own body actually produces antimicrobial peptides that help us can help us find biofilms and can give us indications of that peptides can be one way of disrupting the biofilm structure. And that is what we did. We looked at a few uh, databases like PAMS and Kurumpex and we generated a repository of uh, biofilm active peptides that work on all these stages. And then we generated a biofilm disrupting peptide as our initial positive data set for machine learning and biofilm maintaining peptides as a data set, as a negative data set. So this is a very unusual way. Normally you would have taken a biofilm active versus an inactive peptide. We didn't do that. We took some peptides which were maintaining the biofilm versus peptides which were disrupting the biofilm as the negative and the positive data sets. If you go to the paper, you can read more about it. And then, as uh, the previous professors have told you, how do you basically submit label data to a machine learning model and give new data and try to see if it is able to classify your unlabeled data correctly. So in this case, we generated, as you can see, both STM and Vika-based model on uh, feature selection. Professor Ragnathan has already told about that. 
and we basically identified a whole amino acid as well as certain specific amino acid as features that are contributing to antibiotic activity with a very high accuracy. So this is the first model and the best model that one can use today for prediction of antibiotic peptides. And in order to make our uh, application more uh, relevant, what we actually did, we took 11 FDA approved peptide drugs and nine antimicrobial peptides in clinical trials. And based on that, we made a prediction. So if these are basically, since we have six models, these are all the predictions coming from at least four of them. So the point is that there are multiple uh, models which are saying that this has an antibiotic property. We have recommended it. And if you look at the way uh, the original indication of these peptides is, most of them, we know these indications are because of biofilms. So the point is you don't have any, bio, any anti-biofilm uh, peptide in clinic, but all the antimicrobial peptides in clinic actually have a biofilm phenotype. So this actually also gives us confidence that what we uh, predicted or observed has some meaningful uh, outcomes. And this particular work is very close to me because this is Pooja. She is a, a co-first author with, uh, in, in, the, in the paper. And at the time of publication of this paper, she was just finishing school. And now she, is, uh, she had then later on became the Gates Cambridge Fellow. So this is basically for all the students out there. There is no age to do science. You don't need degrees to do science. It's, it's, it's your interest. And she's really, really brilliant. And now she's doing her PhD at York University. And I have several such examples like that I, because I work with school and college kids extensively. And this is, again, I'm not going to detail this. This is uh, our uh, response to the pandemic. Uh, we cannot just not contribute to what's going on with COVID-19. So we realized that there was a huge problem because everybody is reporting inhibitors of COVID-19, but nobody knows what chemical space are we looking at. So we actually came together and developed this open repository. It is accessible online. And this is an entire set of team that again came together to build this one. I'm not describing it today because this is only a pointer for some of you to uh, join uh, something which the government of India is doing. It's called the Drug Discovery Hackathon for COVID-19. I'm leading the uh, Drug Discovery Virtual Tool Room along with several partners. And all the members out there, please go try, see if you can help address these problems. And this basically shows that uh, my lab has been working extensively uh, using crowdsourcing as a mechanism, like engaging as many number of experts as possible in several projects over the years. And I, as I told you, I really like working with the younger community, um, either it's wet lab or dry lab. And this is what I have, my lab has been doing for a very long time. And uh, most of that has translated into publications. And there's a point is that it is not about only outrage, it is about training how to do serious work. And that is that takes time, that takes commitment, it takes effort. So be ready to put in that. And if you can do it, we can make some meaningful contributions. And last year, I uh, set up a lab in uh, one of the insert units in Paris. And so this is basically all uh, my, my postdocs there, uh, my, a few students, and uh, this is my lab in India. And again, a few colleagues from uh, Jogal and LWB. These are the pointers where you can write to me on Skype, Twitter, or my email ID, and I'd be very happy to talk to you. Just one last thing about my institute. I belong to the Institute of Microbial Technology. I'm not sure how many of you know that, but recently uh, a global impact analysis was done by Database Commons, and Imtech is on at the fourth position in contributions of the databases that we have made to the, to the bioinformatics community. And this is the campus, and had it not been for the pandemic, I would have really invited you all for a physical uh, visit to this place. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you, and uh, we'll be very happy to take any questions.